Good morning. It is the fifth Sunday of Easter, and it's also Mother's Day. We have gotten here quickly, it seems like. I want to uh, wish all of the mothers a happy Mother's Day. Um, mothers of children, uh, mothers of others' children, um, those who have not been able to have their own children, mothers of the church, mothers in ministry, and mothers who have lost children. As uh, sweet as it is to recognize our mothers, we also need to be sensitive and encourage um, and communicate with those, um, those mothers who have lost children because today um, can, be, can be bittersweet um, for them as well. In that we have mothers, and in that we have um, women in the church who, who act as our mothers in the faith, there is a name in the Old Testament that is used for God. It's El Shaddai. Um, you may have heard it in a few songs before, El Shaddai. The, the meaning of that name that God takes, the meaning of that name that is in the, the literal words and language and stories behind how that developed, is El Shaddai is one who broods, um, who broods sort of over the waters um, and creates life. Uh, the El Shaddai is the one who broods over chickens or, or eagles um, and protects them under uh, his body, her body, um, with wings uh, as they're growing, as the chicks are growing. Um, El Shaddai um, is also associated with uh, the Almighty or the All-Powerful um, and in the Hebrew, breasted one, uh, in the same way that you would draw close to yourself to protect, also nourishing from your own body. The, these are the descriptions of God um, in the Old Testament when he's called El Shaddai. And in that, our mothers of all kinds are made in the image of God. They emulate him in those qualities. Praise God for our mothers. Our text this morning and for next week, I want to do two parts. One um, this week, obviously, part one, part two next week. Real creative there. And uh, it'll be from chapter five of the book of Amos. Amos is the first prophetic book written. And if you want to get in your Bible and turn there, um, we are going to go through verse by verse, a few verses this week and some next week. So while you're, you're, you're turning there, I had an experience this week. Um, it was on Thursday. You know, at Avondale, we have a big community meal um, that for many people who attend that community meal, it is their it, it, it is their act of fellowship. For some, it's even their act of worship. Um, it is their safe place um, and place of friendship um, that, that Avondale has on Thursday nights. Well, with the coronavirus, what we've started doing is just uh, preparing hot meals and then handing them out or delivering them to the, the Thursday night congregation. This week I was on my way Thursday um, to the church and from our house, it's just a short little distance. Um, but uh, on 12th Street, um, and, and to be honest, I don't even know the circumstances. They don't, they don't quite matter for the point of my story. There um, had been a shooting and so 12th Street was roped off and there were um, cars and ambulance and, and all this kind of stuff. Which reminded me um, of a video that I had seen earlier in the week, or maybe even that day, um, about a man 
uh, who was uh, shot in Indianapolis. His, la his last name was Reed. Um, and I don't encourage you to watch that. So I'm, I'm not encouraging you to watch that video. I'm just saying that that it exists and I um, saw some of it, which then reminded me of the video that I, I did watch in, in um, Start to Finish about um, concerning a man named Ahmad Arbery from Georgia who was jogging um, in his neighborhood and was um, tracked down by a father and son with, with guns in a car or in a vehicle and, and they killed him. It was overwhelming. I have been overcome by the tragedy, the whole tragedy surrounding that particular situation with Ahmad. And, you know, I just texted the folks that were, were working that evening at Avondale and said, I'm not going to be able to make it. Um, I feel too overwhelmed. And I just had to come home and and grieve and lament. Um, my family let me lay down on the couch and um, have a little quiet time to myself just to grieve. Grieving or lamenting is one of the aspects of um, encountering a broken world that helps us get to the next section of life. It helps us get unstuck from uh, being in that pit of despair. Grieving and lamenting does. And the Bible is full of grieving and lamenting. One prophet is even called the, the, the lamenting prophet, um, which is Jeremiah. Uh, Jesus himself is called a man of sorrows. Um, you've probably heard that in a Johnny Cash song or an old folk song. It gets us out of despair into the neck, you know, back into the land of the living. But the prophets, they don't always stop at just lamenting or grieving. Oftentimes, they move toward what we would call denouncement. Like, they name names. They name situations. And they say, this is not right. And these are the consequences of a land that lives not right. And so you need to hear your pastor say these words to you. Justice and injustice. Our life in Christ is not just about salvation for heaven. It is about the Beatitudes. It is about living in the same way that Jesus himself lived. Or he even says, you will go on to do greater things than me. And if we, and we've been talking about this for a year, if we relegate the faith in Christ just to the canceling of our personal sin and our path into heaven, we have not um, we have not understood the whole gospel. The whole gospel is about living this life now in justice and righteousness. The Lord is the one who not only picks up those who have been thrown to the ground, he uses his other arm to protect them from those that would want to come and harm them further. There is justice and injustice in the world. There's justice and injustice in our own land. And you cannot turn a blind eye or stick your head in the sand to it. You have the capacity with the power of the Spirit to face it. Let me get a drink of coffee. <clears throat> Yeah.
you'll notice that my preaching, we've talked about this before, isn't so much about giving platitudes or inspirational quotes or, or, or inspirational sayings um, to, to take home with you, but rather the encouragement of my preaching and teaching or my ministry comes from that we break the word together. And in that, when we look at the word and when we look at the world, we are forming together. Because church, preaching, teaching, worship, that does not form us differently, the Lord doesn't care about. He's not interested in that. And so our worship, whether it be through prayer, teaching, preaching, singing, the things we say um, in our worship services, if they do not lead to us living life with the view of Christ, living life in the way that he lived, um, then the Lord actually says that that worship is worthless. And so I never want to be a part of worship or training um, that is worthless. And in his words, that doesn't change us to help us be like him. And the word that we use for that is formation. Our worship is to form us differently. It is not just to um, say that we are okay the way we are. The Lord loves us the way we are. But our relationship with him and faith in Jesus is a journey where we're ever learning, ever changing, um, ever moving towards more likeness with him. And so the encouragement in this, when we talk about justice and injustice, is that we are thinking the thoughts of God and we are seeing the world through the eyes of God and through the mind of God when we really break down the scripture. We're seeing it like him, which gives us power for living. And that's what we need, is power for living right. Okay, so have you got to Amos chapter 5? I bet you haven't been there in a while. I would like to do um, verses 1 through 15 today, and we will end on, um, with uh, verse 23 and 24, and then next week we'll look at the other verses, but also end on verses 23 and 24. So today is chapter 5, 1 through um, 15, and 23 and 24. So if you've got their fin your finger there, let's go ahead and take a look. Amos is um, a guy who comes um, into the, the big city where the, the king is, where the, the leaders are, the, the politicians, the religious leaders. And he is from a farming community. He's a shepherd, a sheep herder. And you know how sometimes folks that have been um, in a high or elite position for a while, they, they start to look down on uh, people like sheep herders or those of us that work with our hands with a craft or a skill. We know that happens. Um, and uh, that happens today and it, and it happened um, 50, uh, you know, 1,700 uh, years ago, 1,800 years ago. Sorry, 3,800 years ago. Sorry, my brain, 2,800 years ago. That's the one, 2,800 years ago. But it's the same today. And so you can imagine that they didn't take too kindly to him coming um, and, and giving these laments. But Amos doesn't stop at lament. He doesn't just, which is a good thing to lament. It changes us and gets us out of despair. He names names. 
And this morning I'm naming names in that sense. That there is an injustice in the land. Ahmad Armory, Arbery was killed in the street and nothing happened until a video was released. Here we go. Hear this word which I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, she will not rise again. The virgin Israel, she lies neglected on her land. There is none to raise her up. Amos starts this chapter five with a funeral song. That's what a dirge is. He is singing a funeral song to the house of Israel. Now, Israel, we talk about being God's chosen people. And the, 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 the passages where God calls Israel chosen, um, he'll say, you're my in Deuteronomy, you're my chosen people. And then within the next couple of verses, he says, but if you act like other nations, I'll treat you the same way that I treat all the other nations. So there is not a specialness to Israel in the sense that he treats them differently than the rest of all the nations. That the specialness or the chosenness is that they are the vehicle to bring the word of God to the world and they are the vehicle through their very bodies to bring the body of Jesus Christ into the world. That's how they're chosen. And that's how they're special. But in terms of how God treats nations or societies or communities, he treats them all the same. There's not one that's more special than another. Um, Israel is not more special than Egypt. Um, the U.S. is not more special than uh, another country of the world, right? There, we, God treats us all the same. And, and he treats us based upon the justice and righteousness, whether we uphold it or not, in our land. I know that we often move toward, or at least we've been taught, that it is our personal sin or personal holiness by which the Lord judges the land. And that our personal sin or personal holiness should not be disconnected from um, o overarching uh, sin or holiness. But the scripture, the way that it puts it, the narrative that it gives, the story that we are to be concerned with is the one where it, whether there is justice and righteousness in the land. Whether the, the weak are sheltered whether the poor are sheltered, whether those with disadvantages are taken advantage of, or, or whether they are upheld and bolstered and encouraged, um, whether the powerful go unpunished, whether the powerful go unchecked, whether goodness and righteousness and truth are, are trampled on, or whether they are upheld by the community, the whole land, the whole nation. And that's the way that God speaks about how his judgment occurs with communities, with nations, with people groups. He doesn't speak in terms of someone, uh, individual holiness or, per, or, or personal sin, which is important. That's part of life. That's part of the gospel. That's part of what we're saved from. Um, that's part of what we receive grace from. But for a land, a country, a nation, a people group, the Lord judges based upon how they enact justice or turn a blind eye to justice. And so he opens up and says, as best I can tell Israel, it's over for you. Um, and so I will sing you this funeral song. You have fallen and you will not rise again. Verse three, for thus says the Lord God, the city which, which the city which goes forth a thousand strong will have a hundred left, and the one which goes forth a hundred strong 
will have 10 left to the house of Israel. He's talking about a pruning, that whether they are killed or whether they are removed and put into slavery um, in a different land by a different powerful nation or a different powerful country, um, that 90% are going to be gone, is what he says. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a jab. It's a bit of a riff on on tithe. Um, that we give a, a, a tenth of what we have in order to train and discipline ourselves. That our sustenance or, or our power in life doesn't come from what we can do with our own hands or what we can produce or how much money we can make, um, but rather we give a tenth so that we train ourselves um, that everything comes from the Lord. Because um, we really like to think that it comes from us. Verse, And so he's saying, mm, no, it's the opposite in this sense. A, only a tenth will be left. Verse 4, the Lord says to the house of Israel, Seek me that you may live. Even in this funeral song, there is this hint that you can change. Even in this pronouncement, even in this naming of names uh, that, that Amos does, seek me that you may live, that you might live. Even then, there is a hint of grace, and it depends on us writing our ways. And I don't just mean writing our ways personally. I mean writing our ways as a country, as a nation, as a people group. To write our ways, there might be a little hope if we seek the Lord. And then he mentions three places that were um, places that they would go to what the Bible says defile themselves with other idols. Um, they, were, they were places of worship where all kinds of uh, terrible things went on, um, including um, the sacrificing of, of, of children uh, in fire. And this is where the, the Israelites would go to, to worship. Instead of worshiping the Lord in how um, Moses had set it up, they started to seek these other... Um, gods, and they made their own places uh, of worship. But you know, they, they, weren't, they weren't seeking, they, they weren't, it wasn't some religious fervor in which they sacrificed children in fire. No, they, they sacrificed children in fire. They were okay with that death in an attempt to manipulate the gods that would make their harvest plentiful. In other words, they were sacrificing children so that their economy might be more productive. They were sacrificing the weak, those who should have a protector, children, so that their economy might do better. And so he says, do not resort to Bethel, do not come to Gilgal, nor cross over to Beersheba. For, and those were the places that they were doing this, uh, these practices. For Gilgal will certainly go into captivity, and Bethel will come to trouble. So he says, if you go there, you're going to find trouble too, because those places are going down. And so you have an option actually not to go there. You have an option to stay away. There's a hint of grace here. Don't go to those places. I'm taking those places down, the Lord says. You can stay out of them and avoid the trouble. Verse 6. Seek the Lord that you may live, or he will break forth like a fire, O house of Joseph. And it will consume him, it will consume with none to quench, quench it for Bethel. For those who turn justice into wormwood and cast righteousness down to the earth. So in verse, uh, at the end of four, he says, seek me that you may live. And then in six, he says, seek Yahweh that you may live. Instead of these other gods, 
um, seek Yahweh that you may live. If not, he will break forth like a fire, and there will not be any to quench it. You will lie desolate. You will lie on the land by yourself with no one to pick you up. The the fire will burn. Will burn. Um, and this was uh, often a, a common thing that uh, invading, conquering nations would do, is they would burn the city. Um, and it's a reference to. He doesn't name who. Um, the Lord is, is saying that these are the consequences for living this way. And he says that this, for those who, and, and the, the operative word is turn, change, switch, the old switcheroo, who switch justice into wormwood or bitterness or poison. We come to a court we come to a, a land that promises justice, and instead we find bitterness. We come to a land where people say they follow Jesus, and instead we find justice turned into the bitterness of our souls. We come to the Bible Belt, where people are supposed to know the Scripture, and we find that justice has been turned into bitterness for the poor and for those being taken advantage of. And, and, and then the opera, the, the, in the second part of seven, the operative word is uh, cast down or really trample or beat down or throw down. They throw down righteousness to the earth. They, they, they push righteousness into the ground. They, they, tr they, they take their foot and they they put it on the neck of righteousness and press it into the mud. These are, are, are what a society does, whether it be the chosen people or not, when the Lord says, I'm not going to put up with that any longer. I'm, I'm done with that. You turn justice and you trample or you slam down righteousness. Verse 8. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, you've heard those when you've, um, uh, in, in constellations in the stars, and changes deep darkness into morning, who also darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. It is he who flashes forth with destruction upon the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. What, what, is, what Amos is saying here is that take a look at the stars, these things that are com combusting hydrogen in a fusion. I mean, I don't even really know how to say it. These, these things that are burning hot. Um, and uh, how does the sun sustain itself? I mean, these are deep questions or um, that is able, um, the, the environment that he has created is, is able to have a tidal wave, or um, the, um, the day and the night uh, happen, like he says. He orders these things. These things are too, too big, too powerful um, for us to get a grasp upon. And he says, it, this same Lord who is able to do these things, like an appeal to creation, take a look around. I mean, take a look around at your eyeball. I mean, I mean, study your eyeball. I mean, that is amazing. You know, the Lord is the one who crafts these things. Um, or the way that our heart continuously pumps blood. The Lord is the one who crafts these things. And so if he is the one who crafts these things, he wants us to know, um, please don't rely on your own strength. Please don't think that you're too big to fail, right? Destruction upon the strong, destruction upon the fortress. These are the places that were thought impenetrable. These are the places that um, you would retreat to and nobody's going to be able to breach or bring down the strength of your economy or, or, or your military or your society. Uh, some, some, it's just too strong, it's too big. 
And the Lord says, I, I don't know. Take a look at a supernova or a black hole. Don't, don't think that your strongholds or your strength of your nation um, are somehow off limits uh, to me allowing them to Im implode or break down. And interestingly enough, that interestingly enough, um, the end of verse eight, the Lord or Yahweh is his name, is the center of the passage. Um, at the very middle, uh, you know, key point, uh, drive it home, Yahweh is Lord. That is his name. So anything else that you rely on, um, anything else that you want to name, any other false idols or false gods, and in ancient times, for uh, our people group, um, they had um, idols. Uh, today, we still have idols. We just call them by different names. Verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. Um, the, the one who reproves or teaches, right? The one who speaks justice, the one who speaks righteousness, um, in the gate is hated. Now, the, the, the land that had um, farms and a, a central city that had gates, this is what they're referring to as the gate. The central city that in your land where you would go to, and it was basically the court. Um, the elders and the wise and, and those with enough um, life or, or, or history or even leisure sometimes, to sit at the gate and do ju judging. Um, that's what the gate is. It's the court. And even in the wall, um, right inside, there would be some rooms. And these would be called the, the judge's chambers. Um, these, these elders who, who would judge. And Amos is saying... The powerful of the land hate the one who teaches and instructs in the courts. Um, they abhor him, the powerful in the land. They abhor him who speaks with integrity. It's interesting that he hones in on the courts. The courts being unjust. The system of justice, hating those who teach and instruct in truth. And the system of justice, hating those who speak with integrity. Verse 11, he mentions some more specific things. Therefore, because you impose heavy rent on the poor and exact a tribute of grain from them, though you have built houses of well-hewn stone, yet you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. For I know your transgressions are many, and your sins are great. You who distress the righteous and accept bribes, and turn aside the poor in the gate. Therefore, at such a time, the person, prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time. Amos names names. He says that you have imposed heavy rent on the poor and you exact a tribute of grain from them. And then notice he says, though you've built houses of well-hewn stone, you will not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, yet you will not drink their wine. The common practice was a sort of a clay earthen uh, home. And that's what the majority of people would live in. Unless you were sort of an elite, then you had people quarry stones and bring them from afar to build stone houses. And you had enough land that you could plant vineyards. Now, in, in Israel, if you had a lot of land, it meant that you got it from some other family when it was supposed to always revert back to the family every so many years. And the poor that you're charging rent on, um, they're living on your land, which 
you took from someone else's family to amass your great land wealth. And those vineyards um, are planted by those poor and tended by those poor because you have so much that um, you can't do it all with your own hands. And so he's saying that you impose heavy rent on the poor so that you can build these mansions. Amos is naming names. You are taking money off the labor of the poor in order to build your mansion, in order to buy more land. And there's not a little bit of a hint of a, of a, of a, of a, of a jest here in that um, you can drink a lot, um, you can party a lot with your vineyards that these other people work for you. Um, and produce these great quantities of wine that you can hold these parties with. And he says, you um, distress the righteous and accept bribes. Isn't it how, it, don't, don't we sort of say money greases the wheel here? Um, and the Lord's saying, that's wrong. It's wrong. He says, you turn aside the poor in the gate meaning the poor come to the court in order to get justice and you turn them aside. The poor come to, to get matters settled um, in their favor because people are taking advantage and they, and they don't have money for great defenses or, or money to hire someone to help them. They have to go themselves and the system turns them away at the gate, at the court. When the court to find justice is more important to them than anybody else. And then he throws in a proverb in verse 13. Therefore, and here's the proverb, at such a time the prudent person keeps silent, for it is an evil time. What Amos is getting at in that line is that when your just deserts or your comeuppance come, when the Lord judges you, you ought to consider this. Just take it. Be silent and take it. You don't have any defenses. When the Lord judges you for no justice, when the Lord judges you for no righteousness in the land, don't complain. Be silent and take it. It's an evil time. Verse 14. We see that the first two times, he said, Amos said, seek the Lord, seek Yahweh, that you may be saved. This time, in verse 14, he says, seek good and not evil, that you may live. Seek me that you may live, seek Yahweh that you may live, and then he says, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Another hint at grace but to seek good that you may live. God is saying when we seek justice and righteousness, we're actually seeking him. So don't be confused that seeking Yahweh or seeking good, I'm sorry, seeking me when he says me, God, or seeking Yahweh, don't be confused that when you are seeking God through worship and prayer and Bible study and getting together, um, in, in small groups with others. Don't be confused that seeking me in that way, he's saying um, that you may live. No, 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 no. Seek good. In other words, seek justice and righteousness that you may live. The Lord, in a minute, um, or next week, we're going to look how Amos says, he, the God's not interested in these worship services um, because you don't seek justice and righteousness. So he's like, I'm, get, I'm done with that. Get rid of it all. But seeking good is to seek justice and righteousness in the land. That no one is above the law. Seek good and evil. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And thus may the Lord God of hosts be with you. The Lord God of hosts is the strong one. The one who commands armies in a sense. The Lord God of hosts will be with you, just as you have said. 
hate evil, love good, and establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the Lord God of hosts may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The people in Amos' time had said, we are seeking God. We're seeking good. Uh, we want to love the Lord. We're going to we're going to seek God through our worship services and our sacrifices and our giving. He says, just as you have said that, but you've not done it. It looks great. You look great, but there's not justice in the land. There's not righteousness in the land. In fact, just the opposite. But then that refrain, perhaps the Lord, the strong God of hosts, may be gracious to your land. If the Lord will speak this way to the people of Israel, how much more so to the rest of us? This, these are the codes. This is the mind of God when he comes to looking at nations and people groups. To seek good and not evil is to seek the Lord. And then please skip down to 23 and 24. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not even listen to the sound of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In all the fire that has been promised and mentioned in the burning down and the desolation, seek justice. Let justice roll down like waters. He's saying that doing justice and getting rid of injustice and being righteous and upholding the truth and treating people fairly, regardless of power or status or money, to do that sort of thing is to let, is to let the, the healing, refreshing waters roll down, taking out the fires, to put out the fires. See, there's still this hope that if we will do right, that, the, that, that, that water um, which sustains life by which you must have to live, by which you must have to, to grow, um, will come down and quench all of these fires and put them out. We look around the land and we see fire here, fire there, fire here, fire over there. Injustice this way, injustice that way. Let justice roll down and water will come and heal. And righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I know this is hard stuff. But I also know that as disciples of Jesus, you can handle it. I need to train you into these things so that you can handle it and understand the vision and the mind of God. Conventional wisdom is not good enough in situations where we see injustice in the land and bribes in the land. No, we, we need the wisdom of the Lord. And this is what he says about nations that refuse to change. But notice how many times there's an option. Perhaps, maybe, you do right now. Perhaps water will come and put out all the fires, like a balm, um, like a quenching of dryness like healing, like refreshment, like jumping in the pool on a scorching summer day after working hard. I want to encourage you in your family to talk about Ahmad Arbery. I'm not saying you should watch the video. It's hard. Um, uh, that's your own choice whether you can handle that or not.
but I want to encourage you uh, to talk about this, um, to talk about issues of justice and injustice, not just in the language of what's the good Christian thing to do, but what does God, who is the God of all people, what does he think about justice in a nation and injustice in a land? I want to encourage you to, to speak about this and discuss it. Talk with your children and your grandchildren and know that when you are seeking justice and the good and, and having these conversations, it is seeking the Lord. You're trying to understand the thoughts of God after him. You're thinking the thoughts of God after him. Seeking the Lord and seeking good are the same things. And I also want to encourage you to pray for Ahmad's family, to pray for the father and the son who did this, and to pray that justice is upheld in that county, in that state, uh, 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 Georgia. The place that it took place um, held the video of it for two months. Um, and... Uh, no one would have known unless that video, I mean, nothing would have changed um, unless that video had, had come out. And so we can, in a sense, say with Amos, that county's on fire. But do you know what will quench that fire? What will put it out and bring new life to the whole community there and to those of us affected uh, states away? because we know how terrible this injustice. Do, do you know what? Doing the right thing, upholding the law, upholding justice. That will cause the waters to roll down and the ever life-giving streams to put it out and bring coolness and level-headedness. It will put us in our right place. It will give us boundaries so that we can flourish. When justice rolls down, it brings that cleansing, fire putting out water. We'll come back to this next week when we talk about justice and injustice in land, nations, countries, from the scripture, from what God thinks. Let me pray with you. Lord, for some of us, this is a difficult message, a tough message, maybe even a new message. That it is our duty as disciples to be concerned about justice and injustice in our land. I pray that you would use the words of Amos and anything I may have said, Holy Spirit, please interpret it into the hearts and minds of those listening um, of my congregation to affect formation. Let us be people who say, I wasn't thinking this way. I didn't notice it in this way. But now that we've broken God's word together and eaten it, it doesn't always settle well. But I can be encouraged that I am following in the path of Jesus. And then engaging issues like this is the cost of discipleship. Amen. God's peace to you. Uh, may his word plant in your heart and grow and change you into the likeness of Jesus. Love you very much. Um, see you next week.